Before we get started with this episode, we just wanted to take a minute to send lots of thoughts and love to everyone affected by this global pandemic. Yeah, we wanted to send a lot of boom love out there and say that we'll actually be recording a special bonus episode where we'll talk about the response from the biomechanics community and also what's going on in our own communities. And we just really hope that everyone feels welcome to share their own experiences with us, with each other, because we really are all in this together and we'll get through this together. Yeah, this is a really tough time and everyone you know, processes these things a little bit differently and everyone's experiences are different. But we hope that with this episode, it'll give you a little bit of time to, you know, think about some uh, biomechanics, get your mind off of some of the tough things for a little bit. Hopefully it'll make you smile. Um, And we'd love to hear from you also about, you know, any ideas that you've had for things that are, you know, helpful and things that you want to share. Um, with the community. Welcome to Biomechanics on Our Minds. My name is Melissa Boswell. And I'm Hannah O'Day, and we're PhD students at Stanford University. This podcast is brought to you by the International Society of Biomechanics. It's It's time time for for Boom. Boom. Welcome to Boom, where we have biomechanics on our minds. Boom. 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 Welcome to episode 28 of Biomechanics on Our Minds. I'm Woo! Melissa. And I'm Hannah. <laughs> <laughs> well, right from the start, <laughs> we have issues because we are zooming, <laughs> video chatting, and have some delay issues. It's just the proper verbal distance. We're verbal distancing. We're audio distance or verbal distance. <laughs> we are really sad to be social distancing for the coronavirus, but we're staying safe. Luckily, the interview we have today with Brian Umberger happened. Well, it didn't matter anyways, because he's not with us physically to interview him in person. <laughs> but it was during a calmer time. It was a great interview, and we are so fortunate to be able to continue Boom because it only relies on our voices and not us being physically together. So here we are, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, it is weird, like, not being able to to be there and hold hands while we record, but we make do. (laughs) But yes, we did have a great interview with Brian Umberger, who is a professor of movement science and the director of the Locomotion Research Laboratory at the University of Michigan School of Kinesiology. And in our interview, we talk a lot about using experiments and modeling together and how really that integration is so important to furthering a lot of the biomechanics that Brian is doing and and the field as a whole. We also get to talk about peer review in that process, what it looks like, some of the challenges, and some of the ways that Brian, as an editor of a journal, has um, contributed to that. So that was a really awesome experience to hear about. Um, We also heard about his experience being the president of the American Society of Biomechanics as well, which was just really heartwarming to see the things that he was doing there and the structures he had put in place while he was president. Yeah, it was kind of amazing all of the roles that he has played, um, but it was really great to hear some of the bits of wisdom that he's gained from those different experiences. <clears throat> um, and he was you know, a great uh, interviewee on the podcast, because as he told us, he had recently um, just been interviewed by his son for a podcast with his school. So he was no rookie at the podcast game. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we missed his, um, missed his first podcast experience by just a few days. So, you know, got to act quick. (laughs) Exactly. But before we do that, let's jump into a bit of boom. 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 Happy National Biomechanics Day, Hannah. 
<laughs> Happy National Biomechanics Day to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Even though the live one has been postponed, um, we are still celebrating National Biomechanics Day here on Boom. Um, and we love National Biomechanics Day. <laughs> We really do. And we had a really exciting bonus episode with Paul DeVita, um, who is really heading up the entire National Biomechanics Day initiative and has been continually reaching out for people to share past photos from National Biomechanics Days and still really keep the excitement high, even um, though we can't physically be holding it. Yeah, so... For those of you who don't know, National Biomechanics Day is this worldwide celebration of biomechanics. And uh, the hope is to get um, like high school students and younger students really excited about the awesomeness of biomechanics. And like Hannah said, we have that bonus episode. So if you want to learn more, then you can check out that episode. <laughs> I am like finger pointing at Hannah. And <laughs> it's so hard not to be in the room with you. I feel like I'm presenting to you. It's so hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's really funny because all of Melissa's like really enthusiastic gestures. You'd be surprised how enthusiastic gestures can come over, you know, <laughs> like a two by one inch screen. But um, they are just full of energy and they're about five <laughs> seconds delayed from the words that she's saying. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Just put that picture in your brain. <laughs> but in the spirit of biomechanics, Hannah and I wanted to dive a little bit into the history of biomechanics and where the field started. So Hannah, you want to start us off with some fun biomechanics facts? Sure. I was actually surprised to see that an exact date to define or the start of biomechanics is really hard to pin down. It looks like there are traces of biomechanics interests um, in Egyptian papyri dated 1700 to 1600 BC. Um, What's papyri? <laughs> like a papyrus. It's the plural of... That fruit? <laughs> It's like a papyrus, like the paper, but it's the singular version. What do you mean the paper? Oh, like a scroll. Oh, like a scroll. Yeah. I didn't know what that was. But should I know what that was? I've never written on papyrus before. Um, I, <laughs> I only know because there's a brand of paper called papyrus or like oh, cards. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yes, I actually do know what you're talking about. Is there, I feel like there's symbols like a little bird. Yeah, with a little bird. It is, yeah. <laughs> okay, so. So delayed. Where <laughs> what you're saying, uh, it was first found on a papyri. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we just need to redo that all the way. <laughs> I feel like the people need to know what a papyrus is. <laughs> Thanks for diving us a little bit deeper into what papyri is, Melissa. We really, um, for those of you who don't, you know, aren't nested in all of the Egyptian culture. details of ancient Egyptians, I think that was a really helpful definition. So... <laughs> I think that more of the solid foundations of biomechanics can be traced back also to the time of the great Greek philosophers like Socrates, Hippocrates, all the E's, <laughs> um, and then some of the more modern minds like Leonardo da Vinci, who really studied an extensive amount of human anatomy, even performing dissections to better understand the musculoskeletal system. And he really believed the workings of the human body were actually an analogy to the workings of the universe. Yeah, I think that's really beautiful. I feel like there's probably no beginnings to it because it's like as long as humans were alive, like biomechanics existed, right? And there's like always this curiosity about how people move. It's not like a scientific discovery that we can move. Um, so, but it is really interesting to just like learn about how it's like changed 
throughout. <laughs> um, it's hard when I see you laugh and I don't know what part of what I'm saying is funny because it's delayed. <clears throat> anyway, <laughs> um, we've heard, we might have talked about this before on Boomer. I know we've heard it at a, at a conference. We This interesting fact about Descartes from the 1600s and he believed that spirits entered the brain and then passed into the nerves and then they were able to change the shape of the muscle by like interacting with other spirits that were in the muscles already so um they believed that like we could move from our muscles uh, because of the spirits that controlled them you know almost 400 years later we've still believe that to be true and that's biomechanics and what we celebrate in biomechanics day. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> but it is kind of remarkable how they were able to get kind of close to knowing that there was something, some kind of energy going on in our nerves that was controlling our muscles. They called it spirit. Now we call it what ATP. So Just about there. Anyway, since we can't celebrate National Biomechanics Day in person today. I was wondering what your favorite part about National Biomechanics Day is in general, or like maybe any part from our pre. We've held three National Biomechanics Days at Stanford, and so I was wondering if you have any favorite memories. Are you talking to me? Who else would I be talking to? Sorry, I thought that would be a good joke. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, she got me. <laughs> I got her, ladies and gentlemen. So thank you for the question, Melissa, because I think it's really fun to look back on the many National Biomechanics Days we've been a part of. And I just have to tell our audience that really Melissa has been the queen of National Biomechanics Day at Stanford. She has been a fearless organizer and making everything work just it's always so smooth and so amazing and she's always taking pictures and just getting everyone super excited and the kids love her so am I your favorite national biomechanics day I kind of think that's what I'm saying (laughs) is me buzzing everyone around (laughs) your favorite part of national biomechanics day (laughs) running around (laughs) freaking out it's the one day the one day in my PhD when I know what I'm supposed to be doing. <laughs> oh my gosh. But in all seriousness, my favorite, I think my favorite thing about National Biomechanics Day is really is the people. Like all of the labs come together and you get to see people just really loving their science. And you see that passion come out and you see them get excited about that passion coming out in others, especially in the kids like they come in not knowing what the gastrocnemius is and then they leave being able to show people what it can do yeah and that's just really that's such like a nice way to put it and I couldn't agree more I think one of the favorite things about the ones that we've held is that like we've gotten seven or eight labs every year to participate who all do biomechanics in different ways so we have people that are more Um, on like the tissue side of biomechanics and people that study neuromechanics and how the brain develops and grows. And so it's like all these labs come together in a really cool way. And yeah, I agree. Like at the end, we also have lunch with all the kids and just kind of reflect on what they've learned. And it's so fun to see them excited about biomechanics and learn some new things. Yeah. And I feel like everyone always leaves having that renewed and refreshed energy from teaching. Yeah, definitely. Fun. All right. Well, we hope that you all can celebrate National Biomechanics Day in some way, shape, or form today. Make sure you share why you like biomechanics. Let us know. And let us know the creative ways you've come up with to still celebrate. And now for our interview with Brian. Today we're talking with Brian Umberger, who is a professor of movement science and director of the Locomotion Research Laboratory at the University of Michigan School of Kinesiology. Thanks for talking with us, Brian. Thanks for having me on. 
Yeah, we're really excited to talk to you. We know that your research is focused on better understanding the biomechanics, energetics, and control of human locomotion, and also um, encompassing topics that range from the evolutionary origins of human bipedal locomotion to the development of, of assisted devices to help restore mobility in people with lower limb amputation. Um, all of this sounds really fascinating, and we're excited to talk about it. But um, our favorite way to start off is with the question, when did you first become interested in biomechanics or know that you wanted to become a biomechanist? Sure. Um, it actually goes back quite a ways uh, to well before I knew what biomechanics was. Probably back in uh, junior high or high school, uh, I played a lot of sports and I watched a lot of sports and became fascinated with people's different movement patterns um, and things like the fact that in shooting a free throw or a tennis serve, you could both have two people who looked like they were doing the movement the same way and had very different outcomes, or two people who do the movement, like shoot a free throw very differently, but had similar success rates. Right. Uh, and so, and uh, I also uh, skied and was very much focused on the different ways people would approach going down a hill. Uh, and it was something that was always just there. But at the time, I didn't know it was something you could study in college or make a career out of. Um, and so I went to college thinking I wanted to be uh, a physics major. But I was, I was really bored with sort of the introductory first year courses and had left that behind by the end of my second semester. <laughs> Uh, and I actually floated around a bit, but eventually found kinesiology, which I didn't even know was a thing going into college. And that was a place where I could combine my primary interest in physics with a general interest in science and human anatomy and physiology uh, and got a pretty broad introduction to that as an undergrad. And by the time I was starting my master's program, was really starting to settle in on biomechanics and really haven't looked back. Wow, that's quite a path. Um, and I like that you said you floated around for a little bit because I think um, often when we're f feeling that feeling of floating, it doesn't feel productive, but um, I feel like all of the best stories and some of the most successful people that I've met had really significant periods of floating that really informed. Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was, I, I, it took me, it was pretty substantial. It took me five and a half years to finish my undergraduate degree, in part because I found what I wanted to do kind of late in the process. And I had at least one other official major, economics of all things. Oh, wow. I thought I wanted to, I wanted to study econometrics, sort of the math side of economics. And I probably had two or three other unofficial majors along the way. Uh, and it was, it was getting to the point where I think my parents were a little concerned about, was I going to sort of settle on something and finish? Um, and so there, there was uh, definitely a, a period in there where I don't think you would have predicted I would be where I am now if you were looking at me at 18, 19, 20 years old. Yeah, that's so fascinating. And um, I think when you think about it, it kind of reminds me of the um, what you see in a scientist, though, right? Like having curiosities for so many things and wanting to um, like branch into different areas. So even though you might not have known then, it, it is kind of fun to think about how that maybe has continued in your path as a scientist. So can you talk a little bit about what research you're currently working on? Yeah. So in my lab group, we're focused on trying to understand why humans walk and run the way that we do. Uh, and we have a number of specific areas we work in. And we're always doing studies with healthy young adults, perturbing their gait, walking at different speeds, different stride frequencies, different conditions, trying to understand how the musculoskeletal system functions as an integrated whole system. Uh, with, with a specific uh, focus on trying to sort of understand the integration of mechanics and energetics of movement. Uh, and then we have a number of application areas which we pursue with various collaborators, which as you mentioned earlier, some of that is 
in trying to understand the evolutionary basis for human bipedalism. We're, we're pretty unique in that we're the only mammals that habitually walk upright on two legs. If you look around the uh, animal kingdom, you don't see a lot of other animals that locomote the way we do. So we're pretty unique in that regard. Uh, and then other out and th those that work is pursued with collaborators in anthropology, anatomy, functional morphology. Uh, and then we do work with collaborators who either have clinical backgrounds or rehabilitation engineering. Typically, we have a team of people with different expertise focused on uh, trying to restore function, enhance mobility, uh, improve gait uh, capabilities. Uh, and then in that same vein, I'm excited to be starting up a new project with some collaborators focused on trying to understand what musculoskeletal deficits are underlying the changes in gait we see with aging that are also linked to increased in metabolic cost in that population. Wow, that's quite a range of um, different projects. And it sounds like you've got a number of awesome team collaborators that you've been able to assemble. Did you always have sort of all these different interests or and collaborations or like how did you actually bring these things together and how has that shaped or impacted your research? That's a good question. It, uh, I, I think it's partly my nature, uh, as you were referring to earlier, lots of times scientists are uh, interested in a range of different uh, topics and they all have a common thread about musculoskeletal function and locomotion, even though the applications are very different. Uh, but there's also a bit of serendipity in it in that the, I was just in the right place at the right time, connected with the right people. Uh, I had a chance to work on a project when I was a PhD student and help out with a, a, one of the early reconstructions of locomotion in Australopithecus afarensis, the, the famous Lucy yeah, skeleton. Wow. Um, and so that was something I did not go into my PhD thinking I was going to do that. I'd always been really fascinated by that sort of thing. And then happened to many years later, just connect with the right group of people um, who really are the experts in that area and bring my knowledge in, in biomechanics and musculoskeletal modeling and locomotion simulation and do something together that neither one of us could do alone. Um, the work that has more to do with um, helping better design assistive devices, robotic prosthetic limbs, et cetera, was again, came about because at my previous university in engineering and mechanical engineering, they hired a person who I really connected with well, and we had complementary interests, we worked well together. And um, so as much as a lot of these things look like well thought out plans. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's, always, there's always a bit, a little bit of luck and timing associated with all of it. Yeah. Thank you for calling that out because I think a lot of us get frustrated when sort of our best laid plans don't play out. But I think that it's important to be cognizant of the times and important times when actually your best laid plans might not work out, but it might be for the better or you might be open to a different opportunity that you hadn't um, been, or wouldn't have been exposed to rather if you right. had. I, mean, I, I can think of, I can think of three or four project lines that spent time thinking about and developing with someone. They just never went anywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so all, what you hear about mostly are the successes, but not all the things <laughs> that didn't pan out. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I, I, for some, I'm sort of interested in just going back to you saying that you had the opportunity to work on developing um, the model of, of Lucy? Is that a per gate? Just interested in that story. Like, how did that actually, how, was someone just, someone just come up to you and be like, hey, you're interested in <laughs> <laughs> the evolution of walking? Yeah, so that, that again was definitely being in the right place at the right time. And I, I went to uh, Arizona State University for my PhD, which in the mid to late 90s was sort of a, a hotbed of movement science with this 
group of faculty who had just sort of naturally self-assembled with people from kinesiology and biomedical engineering and some neuroscientists and biology. And then critical for this piece we're talking about is some functional morphologists from the anthropology department. And right about the time I was going there, they received, they had applied for and received an, a National Science Foundation IGER award. Um, I, I oh, think yeah. I think these may have, I think that's been discontinued now and maybe replaced with a different program. But it was a pretty substantial NSF program that funded cross disciplinary, interdisciplinary graduate training, and so it always had mm -hmm. to involve bringing together three or four different fields working on a similar topic. And so you can imagine, um, I, I came into that as a student and just by nature of the program had natural interactions with uh, people with kinesiology backgrounds, biomedical engineers who worked on computational modeling and simulation and anthropologists who had interest in two things in um, locomotion, which is what I was interested in. Then also a group that was working on hand function uh, which is also another major evolutionary development uh, in our early human ancestors. And so th there was a small group of us in kinesiology and biomedical engineering who were working on muscul musculoskeletal modeling and computer simulation. Uh, we're really working as sort of an integrated team. And one of the people, one of the other graduate students I did my PhD with, that turned out to be what he did for his dissertation, Akinori Nagano, who's uh, now a professor in Japan. And uh, I got to play a, sort of a key role in working with him uh, on those projects. And then he has gone on to do other things. And I've sort of picked that up uh, later in my career. Uh, and we're actually uh, have been focused mostly on doing comparative work in modern humans and chimpanzees where we can both do the modeling and get experimental data but we're going to be returning uh, to the fossil hominin part doing some predictive simulations with enhanced models uh, and testing some of the prevailing ideas about how musculoskeletal morphology affects bipedal walking ability that's so interesting and, and interesting how your research has kind of circled back to something that you were doing or started as a PhD student. Um, and I have to say, I have seen the open sim model <laughs> of the chimpanzee. And I'm curious um, about why the face, the skull of the chimpanzee is included because it's a little <laughs> bit creepy. <laughs> it, uh, we definitely get as we've developed that model, it initially, the visualization was just the pelvis and hind limb. And then mm -hmm. over time, we added on the thorax and people, it gets more of a response from people. It looks more like the complete <laughs> thing. And the face, the the skull really just completes it and gets quite a, gets quite a reaction from people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, my immediate reaction was kind of a mix of terror and concern. <laughs> It worked out well that that was during um, one of our lab mates' defenses. Yeah, so. I, 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 think, I think you've probably seen too many horror movies. But. <laughs> no, but I, I thought it was – it It also gives a sense of, like, it re bringing reality into mm -hmm. what you're doing computationally because sometimes it's like if you just have, you know, the lower body or something, it doesn't – Floating in space. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of like – okay, you actually see what you're doing with this and like it makes, a, yeah, what, like you said, like a bigger impression or impact on people. I, I think the, the scientific rationale is to get an impression of like the overall height. You need the skull in there. But oh, okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll go with that. <laughs> that <makes sense>. yeah. <laughs> Can you also just talk a little bit further about, so you, you often cite this use of combination of experimental and computer modeling techniques um, could you maybe just highlight the importance of this? Sure. Uh, in most of what we do, the, the modeling and simulation is tightly integrated, either with experimental data we collect here ourselves, or that we work closely with a collaborator who has the expertise. Like there's only a handful of labs in the world that are set up to collect gate data on non-human primates. Uh, and likewise, if you're working with a specialized clinical population, we've always gone with a collaborator on that rather than trying to do it ourselves. And I mean, the, the, the value 
of modeling and simulation is tremendous, but it has to be done in a way that's grounded in reality. So it doesn't risk becoming just a purely academic exercise. Um, and so just one maybe concrete example of that is the, 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 the one set of simulations we've done and published uh, on Australopithecus afarensis, trying to predict what the locomotion was like and the metabolic cost was a case that was the work we did in the early 2000s. And it's a case where it's an interesting result, but no one can tell us we're wrong and we can never convince a skeptic that we're right because there is no experimental data you could ever collect to verify or evaluate or validate the model. And so the approach we're taking right now before doing more of that is a really rigorous set of modeling and simulation studies in modern humans and extant chimpanzees where we have tight integration of the experimental work and the modeling work. And that will allow us to define what the, what the bounds of uncertainty are when we go back to doing pure simulation work on an extinct organism that we could never get data from. And we have what are known as the two bracket species from an evolutionary perspective. And so we know how closely we can come to predicting experimental data with the model and these two species we can get data from. And it'll give us an idea of how much confidence we should have in this quote unquote pure simulation work on an extinct organism and where the points of uncertainty are likely to be, which I think is really important for properly interpreting that data and also to get acceptance from the scientific community so they understand to what extent they should and should not trust those simulation results. Wow. Th thank you for that was, I feel like, super eloquently uh, interweaving those really two important pieces of your methodology. And um, yeah, I think oftentimes we hesitate to talk about our limitations, but I feel like in modeling and simulation, it's almost, it's equally as important as the model itself, right? Um, understanding that for um, use and interpretation that's appropriate. So I think we'll switch gears a little bit because we really want to talk about some of the roles that you've taken um, in your academic career. Um, so, so first talking about um, being an associate editor of the medicine and science in sports and exercise. Um, so could you just talk a little bit about um, your experience um, with this journal? That's a journal of the American College of Sports Medicine. Um, what's it like to be the editor? What does that entail? And even what are some of the challenges of, I'm sure you review a lot of work and um, challenges in trying to do that and do it well. Yeah, like most people who work in our field, you, you start with publishing papers and over time you get asked to review more and more frequently and that you really play a major role in the process through that. And the opportunity a, a number of years ago to move up into the, an associate editor role uh, was something that it, it, it I mean, there's, it takes a bit of time. Um, but it's really it just gives you so much of a greater appreciation for the peer review process um, and our um, sort of our system of scientific publishing and its strengths and weaknesses and how it's undergoing changes. Um, some of the I mean, it's incredibly rewarding to when you see papers come out in the journal that you were responsible um, for, for overseeing, or if there's papers that ultimately you wind up rejecting and you see the authors took the feedback they were given and improved upon that and it's published in another journal. I've seen that a number of times. I mean, that's all part of the process of trying to make sure the work that gets published is the, the highest possible quality. Um, some of the challenges are that there's been an explosion in the number of journals and manuscripts submitted and everyone is really busy. And sometimes you have to ask a lot of people before you get two or three quality reviewers who agree to take some time out of their week to provide feedback on, a, on the manuscripts. Um, the uh, other 
and I, I, I still review for other journals. So I, I know exactly when people decline, what they're faced with and all the different things they need to balance. Um, the biggest challenge is when, uh, when the decision is not clear cut. I mean, sometimes it's just obvious that a manuscript should be rejected and other times when it should be accepted. But there's always those cases in the middle where you've got uh, competing factors and conflicting reviews uh, from the reviewers. And uh, it winds up becoming a, a bit of a judgment call. And if it's the, a topic you're familiar with as an associate editor, you can also exert your own judgment in terms of your read of the paper. But oftentimes you're handling manuscripts where you're not a, a primary content expert. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's an inexact science. I think it's, it's over all a high quality system that works, but it's definitely not a, a perfect system. And uh, definitely um, a lot of, for me at least, a lot of time is spent on those difficult cases and did you write, make the right decision accepting or rejecting a manuscript. Mm. Are there any ideas for ways in which you think we can start to overcome some of those challenges? Yeah, well, there's, there's a number of movements uh, that have begun uh, towards um, more open access uh, in the publishing process and different ways in terms of how you hand different publishers and different uh, groups handle that different from a financial perspective. Um, there are movements to be more permissive in what is published and let sort of much of the review happen after the fact by whether the community, scientific community winds up citing that work or just sort of letting it fall to the wayside. And uh, having been immersed in it a bit the last few years, I, I don't have any great insight in terms of, yes, this, these are the one or two things we should do and that's going to make the process much better. I think it's, it's really complicated and there's probably a, not a one size fits all solution, but a number of things that could be done uh, to help improve the process. Yeah, I think we've actually talked about um, some of the like open access mm -hmm. issues and other things on the podcast, but we haven't ever talked about that review process or what it's like to be an editor. So thank you for sharing your experiences there. And I think it's really important, especially for our budding scientists that are kind of going to be entering those roles. Um, a lot of graduate students, I think, are in our audience. And um, I know I've been excited to be part of that process. I've been on the other side where you're hoping that your paper gets submitted. Probably one of the things that, that we could do to make the overall process better, not so much in a, um, a open access aspects in that, but I mean, peer review is so important, What kind, regardless of what model you're using. And it's something that we, in terms of how we train PhD students, generally provide people with very little experience in. And so that's another area in which I think the process could be improved in. Uh, I, I, I benefited from my PhD advisor providing me with some guidance in that and allowing me to do sort of a guided review of a manuscript. And I, I've tried to do that with my own students, but there's no formal way in which you learn how to do that. And so the reviews people provide, even established scientists, range tremendously in the quality of them and the appropriateness of them. That's another area uh, that would help the overall process if everyone knew how to really do high quality reviews. Yeah, I yeah, we are in total agreement. I think just kind of brainstorming here, I think we think that'd be actually something really useful to be able to spread either in podcast form or have some kind of document or something mm -hmm. that we could provide. Um, so we might check back in with you on more about that later <laughs> in the future. Um, but, but speaking of to your excellence as a reviewer, you recently won the Journal of Biomechanics Excellence in Reviewing Award. Um, so is there anything in particular that you would, you know, sans our complete document and guidelines on how to be a good reviewer? Is there sort of a nugget that you'd like to share that might be useful um, for right now for our listeners? 
Sure. I mean, there's a lot of things that go into providing a high quality review when you're called upon by a journal to do that. And there have actually been a few papers that have been written trying to highlight different elements of what should go into a peer review. And there's other resources online. But uh, among other things, I mean, you need you need to be objective. Um, you're probably being called upon because you have some expertise in the area uh, and you might have some skin in the game, so to speak, in terms of whether a manuscript you're reviewing supports your viewpoint on things or challenges it. And so you always have to maintain your objectivity. Uh, and you also have to focus on what are the, the key things the editor needs to know to make their decision. And so that uh, big picture issues like, is the work technically sound? Do, is everything presented in a cohesive, understandable fashion? Do the conclusions, are those actually supported by the results or are the conclusions, sometimes the conclusions are what the authors went into the study thinking and are not always tightly uh, aligned with what they actually found. And so th those are the really, those are the big picture issues um, that really influence whether work is suitable for publication or not, as well as, is it a good fit with that journal? People sometimes get focused in on some of the minutia, like tech, uh, technical details about the methods or editorial comments about whether it's written in first person or third person. And those are all things that can be commented on. But I think that the really valuable reviews that I get as an associate editor and I try to provide focus primarily on the, the main issues that determine whether the work is suitable for publication and then also provide some more specific comments that maybe improve the wording or the flow or the organization of the, of the manuscript. Yeah, that's really helpful. Like, so the two kind of big things that, that I got from that was one, maintaining objectivity and then two, keeping those big pictures in mind when determining if the work was, is publishable. And I think keeping both of those in mind in terms of what makes a good reviewer is really helpful. So thank you for sharing that insight. The last role we wanted to ask you about is being the president of the American Society of Biomechanics. Um, the, and that was from 2018 to 2019, and now you're the past president-elect. And so we're wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what your experience was like um, in this role and perhaps what initiatives you were or maybe you still are most excited about. Yeah, I'm uh, always happy to talk about uh, ASB, the American Society of Biomechanics. Um, outside of the institutions I've worked for, uh, ASB has played uh, the biggest role uh, in my professional development of, of any other organization or entity. Uh, I've been a member for a member for over 20 years. Joined as a graduate student, uh, and I've just gotten so much out of the society um, and di different programs they offer. The opportunity to sort of to develop as a scientist, make lifelong connections with with friends and collaborators uh, d develop in terms of leadership skills moving up through the organization. Uh, so when, it, when the opportunity came to run for president and then being elected, I was just absolutely blown away by it. Uh, and the opportunity to give back to an organization that's provided me so much has been one of the highlights of my career so far. Uh, the, the major initiative I undertook was to do a, a strategic planning activity for the society. And so we've spent more than the last year beginning with uh, a survey of the entire membership to find out what, what people like about ASB, what they want us to maintain, what they would like to see more of, uh, and worked with a consultant who does strategic planning for organizations, uh, developed developed a draft strategic plan, received feedback on it from focus groups, uh, uh, select groups of people uh, who represent the different levels of diversity within the society, um, 
And we're, we're nearing, we've basically completed that and are about to put the, the final strategic plan out to the membership for a full vote. And so I'm just, I'm very happy with the product we've wound up with and the different goals and strategies we've identified to move the society forward and make sure that as it grows and we move in through the rest of this decade, that it's providing the members with what they want in terms of new opportunities while trying to maintain what it is that everyone likes about the society. I mean, ASB is unique in that it's a lot of professional societies that have biomechanics as part of them, as part of its mission. Uh, engineering societies, ASME, physical therapy, American College of Sports Medicine, physical anthropology, but ASB is the only domestic society that biomechanics is front and center. It's its main reason for existing and actually brings together the people from all these different disciplines. Uh, so to be able to play a small role in helping lead that and, and set help set the direction for the future has been just incredibly rewarding. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Because I think we often think of, um, I liked how you, again, talk about uniting all these diverse groups, including the consultant. Like I think oftentimes we think about these leadership roles as sort of solitary, I mean, informed by hopefully the people involved, but also solitary in making these big decisions. But um, I think that just speaks to your ability to capitalize on um, people's skills that are helpful to making those decisions, um, like, a, like a consultant who can help you craft that long-term plan. And uh, Right. None of us have this expertise. I mean, right. we have content knowledge, but none of us really do this for a living. Right. Right. So bringing in that point person. Yeah, that's awesome. So I guess I feel like in all of our questions, you've demonstrated sort of an exquisite put together path and, um, and, openness also to new opportunities that you've been able to take advantage of and um, and really bring you to new new places. But along sort of all of these different pathways and journeys, we're wondering if you'd like to share an experience that maybe didn't go as planned and could be perceived as a failure, because we like to talk about failure on the podcast. Um, so yeah, if you can think of any stories like that, we'd be happy to hear. Sure. Um, well, it, it's, I mean, if you're being honest, it's actually kind of easy because the, the nature of progress in science is, is you're learning from a mix of successes and failures. Uh, and the failures generally outnumber the successes. So uh, anyone who says they don't have any failures to share is either not being honest or just doesn't want to acknowledge them. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, much of what we do uh, doesn't work out. And you wind up, I don't know if it's failure per se, but you wind up facing a lot of rejection in academia I mean, success rates on, I mean, you think you put all this time and effort into a grant proposal and the sec success rates are 5%, 10%, 20%. The vast majority of the really high quality work that's proposed doesn't get funded. Um, I think the, 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 the examples for me, if I think about my own research is um, people who do uh, human movement simulation, uh, the, the, their, their results folders are just littered with failures um, <laughs> it, 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 because most, most of what you do doesn't actually work out. And it's the case where what you see when you go uh, to conferences are the simulations someone generated of walking or jumping or running, um, and they don't show you the, the tens or hundreds of thousands of cases that didn't work out. Most modeling people keep a, like a blooper roll uh, of all the wacky oh, that's simulation awesome. <laughs> results. Um, and I mean, my the, the very first time, this is going back to 1999, 2000, the very first time I tried to simulate a minimal energy cost walking. So get, get a model to walk forward with minimal metabolic cost. I, I coded up the cost function uh, and ran a simulation or ran an optimization. And so back then it took a long time. So you let it run for a couple of days, not knowing what it was doing. You come back and take a look at the result and you pull up the animation and the model just fell forward. 
just like flat on its face. And it, it the goal was to get the get a forward displacement of the center of mass with minimum cost. And it did it. It, it moved the center of mass forward with almost no cost. It shut <laughs> off all the muscles and fell on its face. Yeah. Uh, in, 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 in doing that, you learn something about the difficulty of trying to take the objectives about why we move the way we do and put them in mathematical form. Uh, and it, it, as much as that was disappointing and humorous, in hindsight, I learned I, I learned something about that in terms of what the constraints are on our movement or how we put that in a, a mathematical context. And the next simulation was not the final one, not a success, but it was better in that the model actually took a step forward rather than fall. Yeah, that is progress. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, and I like that you said that a lot of um, simulation uh, work, when you're doing that, you end up just being littered with so many failures. And, and there's some um, benefit perhaps to just to keeping maybe those failures organized and like being <laughs> aware of what <laughs> failures you've had to just better inform current research or uh, future research. Yeah, and so, some of them are, are simply lo uh, local minima that tell you there's actually different ways we could move besides the ways that people stereotypically do. And a, a related question would be, well, why don't people move that way? If it's a if it's a mechanically feasible solution, why is it we <laughs> don't do that? And then we just yeah. fall on our face and then yeah. we just build a robot. Maybe not, may, like maybe, maybe, may, maybe not that one. It's sort of like the wonky up and down gates we get. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so the last question we want to ask you is what you're most excited about for the future of biomechanics. Um, probably th there's, there's two things that really excite me and one, one's on the experimental side, one's more on the computational modeling side. And on the experimental side, we were always limited in what we can do with humans, uh, limited to generally non-invasive experimental procedures with few exceptions to that. And I think that the, there's developments, particularly in the imaging area, where we're learning much more about what's happening inside the body. And I, I think that's probably we're on the beginning of a real upward slope in terms of what the potential is there. I mean, you think it's probably been 20 years since you started seeing people just start to use like ultrasound probes to image muscle fascicles during a movement. And uh, I think that is really accelerating and we're going to be able to do so much more uh, in informing modeling and simulation studies, which is what I'm thinking of, but also a whole range of just experimental studies where we get much more insight on how things work inside the body. Uh, and then on the computational modeling side, uh, as algorithms develop and computers get faster, things just become feasible that we couldn't do before because we were limited by computer speed or algorithm performance. And um, I mean, direct collocation has really revolutionized optimal control simulations. And I think that's probably just a starting point. And in, in circa 2000, if you ran, tried to do a simulation of a 2D walking model, one step on the fastest computer we had in the lab, that would take maybe a week or two, just continual runtime. And now we can knock those out in 30 minutes, an hour, two hours on my laptop. And 10 years ago, we used to maintain a Linux, a small Linux cluster in the lab with eight compute nodes. I think it cost $20,000. And now the workstation next to my desk has 36 cores and it I think costs four or five thousand dollars and so there's just so many things that become feasible I mean one of the things I think is a big limitation is for a long time we've just we've generated an optimal result and because it took so took so much time we called it good and ran some analyses on the simulation results and we should really be doing a lot more probabilistic, analyses and looking at ranges of uncertainty and doing Monte Carlo analyses. And those are all very computationally demanding procedures, but they, they become more and more possible as uh, computer speed increases. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that's a great perspective. I think highlighting the past, but also seeing where we are now and 
yeah, really seeing where we're going to push into the future. So thanks for that. Yeah. Um, well, this has been such a great episode, and I think we've learned a lot and been super excited to talk to you since meeting you at ISB this past summer. So thank you so much for joining us um, on the podcast today. Yeah, well, I, not, I uh, want to thank you not only for having me on, but also thank you for this great service you're providing for the biomechanics community. It really is awesome. Oh, thank you. It's really, no, I mean, this is so fun for us, like just having the opportunity to talk to to experts in the field like you is really an honor for us as well. And um, with following your work or if students want to learn more about what you do, um, how can they find you? What's like the best way to either reach you or follow your work? um, You can um, uh, go to my website. Uh, if you just type, if you search uh, University of Michigan, Brian Umberger, it'll, the, one of the top links is my lab website uh, or to my Google Scholar page if you just want to see publications. Uh, but on the lab website, it has my contact information. Okay, awesome. awesome. And you're also on Twitter. I don't. Uh, um, yep. Yeah. And you're, do you handle. mind sharing what your handle is? <laughs> uh, it's just at Brian Umberger. Okay. Well, that's easy enough. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Nothing fancy. <laughs> Burger with an E, not a U, right? Correct. U M B E R G E R. Got it. <laughs> well, thanks again. Sure. Yeah, we really appreciate it. And we're looking forward to seeing you at the next conference. Yeah, me too. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Now for our favorite segment Research Fails. might think that when all of your meetings are video conferences, there's no way that you could have a research fail. But I think that they've actually amplified in (laughs) the Zoom meetings that have been occurring. Yeah. Have you had any? Well, I think I witnessed one. (laughs) (laughs) So Melissa received a text midway through our weekly lab meeting because, um, (laughs) I needed someone to know what I was experiencing and basically 15 minutes into, you know, the hour and a half or so long meeting, I (laughs) accidentally flipped my entire lunch of rice, vegetables, avocado, salsa, lots of like really mushy (laughs) foods, flipped the entire container onto my lap. (laughs) <laughs> and as I just like looked at it on my lap and on the floor, I just felt so constrained because my video was on. I actually had just finished talking during the lab meeting because we were doing sort of like announcements and catch ups. And I just like look at myself and look to see if anyone else has noticed. I didn't think anyone else had noticed, but I was debating whether I should clean myself up. Do I turn my video off? Um, do I eat it? Do I push it all onto the floor? (laughs) Um, And then luckily, (laughs) luckily I was able to turn my video off, go clean myself up, come back with a new snack since I just spilt my lunch all over the floor, which I promptly then dropped that snack on the ground. I don't know what was wrong with me. And I decided to give up eating. (laughs) (laughs) Never give up eating. Um, yeah, that is, that is rough. It's a nice feature though, to be able to turn off your camera and, um, fix yourself and then, you know, start again. Yeah. How about you, Melissa? Yeah. I also had a bit of a fail over zoom this week. Um, I joined this, gosh, I'm blanking on the word. Oh, accountability buddy group thing. And I was like, oh, that sounds like something interesting. And also you got free lunch with it. Like they sent you a gift card to grub hub so I was like that seems like something I should do so I did it but when I got on um so I set it up just in my living room and I like um turned off my camera and I was sitting there with my roommate so we were like both listening to it and um they were just but it actually turned out that it was just focusing on physical activity and I thought it was maybe going to be like like kind of work related because I 
I like working out. I and I like keep it part of my routine so far. So I, but I feel like working has been more of a struggle for me. So I turned to my roommate and I was like, I thought this was going to be about, and then like, right, like mid sentence, I hear what? And I was like, huh? And she was like, and I was like, I forgot to mute myself. But like, luckily I didn't like get through the whole, like I was going to be like, I thought this was going to be about work or whatever. Like, not that it would have been that bad, but it was still like embarrassing. Like I would have felt bad that I like interrupted her with this like rude question. <laughs> Anyways. So then we, like, <laughs> I decided to continue. We went into our breakout group. So I turned my camera on and then we went back into the main group and I turned my, uh, and I muted my, I made sure to mute myself. And then I was just listening to her, but I was like getting hungry. So I went to the kitchen to get my lunch. I came back. I like had on workout clothes, but I like had it covered up with a sweater when I was on the camera. And then I was like, took like, I had just like took my sweater off because I was just my work. <laughs> and then I was like just making these wild gest- gestures to my roommate because we were having like a fun conversation to where I was like laughing so hard I like fell over. And then I realized that I had left my video on that time. So then I was like so embarrassed. And like I think the last if you see me is like crawling <laughs> to my video camera out of embarrassment and like <laughs> shutting. So lesson learned, <laughs> Melissa needs a new accountability buddy if anyone has a group that, that she can join. <laughs> <laughs> I am banned. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, so that was that. I've heard like a lot of worse stories and I've seen a lot worse videos. So I don't feel like that bad. But actually, there was someone on Twitter that said that um, – in Zoom, I think it was Zoom when they do the, like translate the what she's saying to um, text. They it keeps translating biomechanics to Bible Catholics, <laughs> and I don't know why it just like made me laugh because it was just so random. <laughs> oh, that reminds me of when I was doing I was abbreviating something in an experimental protocol, and I was. Mm-hmm. abbreviating something I won't go through the whole long thing but the abbreviation that I came up was CLVG and then I was like oh my gosh that's cleavage <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh so, that's so I decided that I shouldn't abbreviate <laughs> I had a friend who like purposefully tried to make inappropriate abbreviations out of like projects that he was working on to like put them in his paper. Why are we not doing that? I don't know. We need to be more fun. Well, thank you for listening to this episode of Boom. Um, We wanted to thank the International Society of Biomechanics for um, supporting the podcast. And we also wanted to thank... Peter Washington, who makes all of the wonderful sounds and music that you hear. Yeah, and if so, if you want to submit a research fail, um, suggest a person person to interview, get involved um, with Boom in some way, just send us an email at biomechanicsonourminds at gmail dot com, or you can follow us on Twitter at biomechanics o o m. How are we going to do this synchronous biomechanics off our minds? <laughs> We're going to give it, it a go. <laughs> I think you should do the countdown. All right. Bye, Bye mechanics. mechanics. Off, Off our minds. minds.